Okay, so it's uh, it's one o'clock, so we'll get started if uh, everyone's okay. Welcome to Grand Rounds. My name's Tom Farden, and I'm one of the uh, consultants here in the Spirit of Medicine and chair and organizer of Grand Rounds. And thank you very much for joining today on this beautiful uh, afternoon, which is a makes a change after the terrible floods and rain we've had the last couple of days. Summer in Scotland. Uh, so not everything is COVID related, but some things are still certainly very COVID related. So um, we are turn over grand rounds this week to, to Jai Manik and his uh, band of merry folk who are going to tell us about the impact that COVID had on the surgical pathways here in Nine Wells, uh, what they did to combat that and what the plans are going forwards. So he has a team of folk who are going to speak. I mean, he's going, I'm going to leave him to introduce everybody. Um, standard operating procedure for Zoom, of course, everyone is muted. Um, if you have a question, please put it into the chat box along the side. You can send it to me so I can ask the questions or we can, um, we can send over to you uh, at the end if you have any questions you want to ask in person. Uh, please don't share your screen unless you're one of the speakers. And with that, we'll hand over to Jay, uh, to Jay and on we go. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is, I'm Jay Manik, ENT consultant. Um, this is going to be a joint presentation with Dr. Rakapathy, gynae oncologist, and uh, Stephen, uh, orthopedic consultant, and Christina, uh, anesthetic uh, consultant. Acknowledge uh, Chris McDonald is a maxillofacial consultant, and uh, um, uh, Scott uh, Davison for uh, data collection. We are involved in two studies. One is a COVID surge and COVID cancer. The COVID surge is about assessing the perioperative mortality and uh, assessing the complications. COVID cancer is implications in cancer management in, during the COVID pandemic. NIHR study, this is one of the largest uh, population-based uh, study. Uh, currently we have uh, 41,000 patients from 86 countries. Um, uh, we are fortunate to enroll, uh, enroll in, this, in this study. The methodology is it's for assessing uh, mortality, we included the patients seven days before or, uh, or patients who acquired COVID within 30 days of surgery. 30-day um, mortality was the primary outcome and 30-day uh, pulmonary complications were the secondary outcomes. From Nine Wells' perspective, uh, Chris first uh, approached me for the study, then I got help from the task, then uh, we managed to uh, get a clinical governance approval after uh, getting Caldicot uh, um, approval, which was uh, approved uh, within a week, uh, and uh, data collection was uh, uh, possible with multiple subspeciality PIs and collaborators. Um, the information governance team did a very clever idea um, they, they linked the public health and opera theater system. So we are getting weekly report uh, about the mortalities and complications. I want to stress this fact. This is the a page, uh, publication uh, published in Lancet uh, in March, uh, fi sorry, 15th of uh, May. Uh, we are all talking about this paper, but it's important to know at that time the COVID was kind of peak uh, things are very different now. It's, um, it's good to have a good number of patients. It's 1,100 patients all over the world, but uh, nearly 500 patients from UK. So we could trust this and generalize to UK population. Uh, sadly, 24% uh, is a mortality rate. Uh, emergency mortality rate was uh, around um, uh, 25 and uh, elective surgery was 19. In normal circumstances, just for the reference, for emergency surgery mortality is 10%. It's nearly 2.5 times higher uh, in this uh, series. Further a breakdown about the pulmonary complications, pulmonary complications, um, nearly 51% uh, developed uh, pulmonary complications. Uh, um, so due to kind of pneumonia and ARDS. 
in normal circumstances, the complications related to the pulmonary, especially for surgical patients, around 8%. So overall, the mortality, unfortunately, for surgical patients around 24, 51% developed pulmonary complications. Those who died, 83% developed pulmonary uh, due to the pulmonary cause. The risk factors, they stratified male sex, age greater than 70, patients with cancer diagnosis, emergency surgeries, or surgeries involving major long durations. Um, so they concluded uh, post-op complications and mortalities will be higher. So try to manage these patients in non-operative manner or, or postpone the surgery. So how did we do at the time? From the nine wells data, we have 14 patients identified, especially during the peak of a pandemic. Um, and sadly, five uh, passed away, which shows overall mortality is 35%, which is I would take this as a pinch of salt because it's, we can't come to any meaningful uh, conclusion or uh, we can't interpret this data because of the small number. Um, and there are, um, um, there are limitations in our data collection as well. So orthopedics, um, Stephen is going to talk more about orthopedic patients. Um, vascular, we have three patients um, and uh, one sadly died. and. Uh, Urology and uh, maxillofacial did not have any mortality, and general surgery had one mortality. The risk factors for the patients uh, beyond age beyond 65, uh, obesity, ischemic heart disease, uh, asthma, those are the risk factors. And time duration for the COVID-19 infection, which is, I want to stress, uh, it is for all patients around 16 days and the mean of uh, diseased patients around 14 days. So what are the risks? How to minimize it? I mean, the identified risks are moderate to severe asthma, COPD, diabetes, severe heart disease, severe obesity, CKD, and age greater than 70, which is slightly debatable, and immunocompromised and liver disease. So the options, different pathways, which Christina is going to talk. And there are facilities in described in different hospitals like gold, silver, and bronze uh, facilities depends upon um, uh, subspeciality um, separating these surgical patients from other patients. Um, and uh, uh, the matter of COVID prevalence, as far as I know from the last, our taste site prevalence is less than one, I think. And uh, management of patients with the isolation, screening, testing, and risk stratifications. These are the strategies we may have to kind of continue. And this is uh, from OCS webinar. Um, they stratify into uh, four uh, different risks. Uh, again, uh, this is partly evidence-based, and the full evidence is going to come in October study as a part of the COVID week study, which is a comparative study, will give you more a detailed information about the risk stratification. But at this moment, a lower risk is less than 60, age 65 with no risk factors and very high risk, all the patients with three or more risk factors. So are we ready? Yes, the PPE, uh, you can assess that in different parameters. PPE is certainly like many medical specialties, surgical specialties do, uh, did have problems um, uh, with the aerosol generating, but fortunately, uh, PPE was not an issue, uh, even from uh, ENT perspective or maxillofacial uh, or other um, uh, anesthetic perspective. Uh, increasingly, we are getting more theaters and patient preferences. Uh, it, it's, some of the patients did not want to have a surgery, but increasingly, we are getting more patients. Uh, they are willing to have surgery, but still they have problems with isolations because of the partners uh, and other social issues. Uh, interesting um, survey, one third of surgeons are still not keen to operate. Um, and um, it depends whether we are doing elective or emergency work. This is one of the another interesting paper was published on 15th of um, uh, July, which it's a fantastic study, population based study. Uh, he used uh, modeling for whether COVID is going to kill more cancer patients. Um, uh, subsequently, it was on the news as well. Uh, but I'm not entirely sure from uh, our perspective. Uh, I was speaking to uh, maxillofacial Kishore and Chris as well. Um, 
from head and neck cancer perspective, uh, we have adapted very quickly. We carried out virtual MDTs and virtual clinics, breaking bad news over the phone and uh, adapting Bono uh, guidelines uh, using uh, head and neck risk calculators for uh, aggressive vetting and endoscopy. The credit goes to the clinical lead and the ENT team. They managed the proper setup uh, and continuously, uh, because it's a high risk, uh, especially for ENT and anesthetic team. And a lot of uh, modifications in the diagnosis and treatment without compromising overall survival and uh, uh, collaboration from multidisciplinary team, particularly radiology, pathology, and oncology and allied specialties. Uh, interestingly, there is no cancer breach. In fact, the cancer patients were treated more quickly because of no elective work. So, uh, is surgery safe now? From our perspective, yes, because last five weeks we are not getting any uh, weekly data did not show any uh, infection of uh, opera surgical patients with the COVID, no mortality. Is the situation better at Tayside? Answer is possibly yes. How to make it safe? That's what Krishna is going to talk. Uh, our cancer surgeries are compromised now. Less, I mean, less likely to some extent, yes, follow-ups, but not actually uh, new cancer patients. That will be backed up by I think Dr. Rakhapati is going to talk more a uh, gynae cancer perspective. Um, I'm handing over to Kalpana. Very good afternoon. Uh, so before I begin, a big thanks to um, Louisa Ramsey, who's a foundation year doctor. She worked incredibly hard during the COVID times and uh, was a collaborator for this um, study with the data collection. So looking back pre-COVID, if we rewind ourselves to uh, February perhaps of this year, all I had to do on a Tuesday, which is our operating day, is actually come to Theater 21 at Nine Wells, do the safety huddle, bond with the surgical team, go through the learning outcomes for the trainees and students, and then just operate safely. I had just only one worry. It was utmost of the worry for me and the staff. Do I have my purple goggles? Because if I had that, like, like this is the best piece of equipment. If I have it, the entire day then will be uneventful. Then COVID strikes us and my life changed. I have operated irrespective of the days where theater space is available. I have operated in any of the theaters ranging between nine and 12, across sites, both at Nine Wells and Perth and worries, there is a lot of worries. I think I do need uh, proper counseling and debriefing after the COVID times, but my main worry was I couldn't use the purple goggles anymore because I was fogging up these goggles and they're not part of the PPE that was uh, given as a safety measure. So what were the actual challenges during uh, COVID times? Paramount, of course, everybody would want to think, you know, it is absolutely patient safety. The initial studies, what Jay has made, uh, um, presented, showed that there was 50% risk of ITU admission and 20% risk of death if somebody was to acquire perioperative COVID infection. Now, this was extremely difficult for us because in the cancer clinic, we are breaking bad news to the patients, telling that they do have cancer, and then going through these risks with them about the surgery that could be a potential cure for them was extremely challenging. Then the second component, which was new to all of us, is how to keep the surgical and the theater staff safe. We had to break down all the components, literally all the steps of our surgery, we had to break it down to see which is the aerosol generating procedure, how do we minimize the risk of exposure to coronavirus to the staff. Operating with full PPE, um, it's, 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 it's a complete challenge in itself. Uh, we were getting dehydrated quite quickly. Um, and um, yeah, obviously if we drink a lot before surgery, you know, bladder is a problem as well. Then the second thing is communication. We had to yell a lot to actually, even for the assistant to hear us as to what we are talking. Now, all this I think is similar to specialties, uh, but for gynae, there were two unique concerns we had. These were, what is the asymptomatic carrier rate of coronavirus in the female genital tract? Now, the other thing was our patients, the bulk of the cancer patients are actually women with endometrial cancer 
Um, and for them, because they do have a high body mass index, which is a precursor, of, which is a direct risk factor for endometrial cancer, laparoscopic surgery has far more advantages rather than risks. But do you, doing these laparoscopic surgeries during COVID times, is it safe enough, especially with the air leak? Um, the patient would have had a general anesthesia, be giving a steep trendland bug, would that, is that increasing the aerosols generated? We use diathermy, we use pneumoperitoneum. All these three components are very important to do the surgery safely, but we didn't know whether we were increasing the uh, exposure of the staff by still continuing to do these procedures. So just looking for the first, um, looking for answers for the first question, asymptomatic uh, carrier rate in the female genital tract, we looked for evidence far and wide within the UK, across the Europe, and it was a clean slate. And if anybody is wondering what, where we looked, yes, we looked at Cochrane, PubMed, and the Royal Colleges. And even Professor Google and Wikipedia didn't have answers to this. The study in March 2020, collect, uh, it was from Wuhan. They had collected uh, different specimens from COVID-infected uh, patients. Um, and they showed that they showed the carrier status in the um, um, bronchialveolar lavage, in the urine, in the feces, but vaginal secretions, vaginal uh, fluid was not included in this study. So we didn't have any evidence to support or refute if coronavirus would be in the um, uterus, cervix, or vagina. Then later during the year, uh, year in May, another study from Wuhan sampled uh, the vaginal fluid of women admitted critically unwell in intensive care due to COVID infection. And they showed that actually the SARS-CoV-2 virus does not exist in the vaginal fluids of severe COVID-19 patients. But if you look at the number, it's only 10. So we didn't know if we could actually use this evidence uh, to uh, establish our surgical uh, practice. So the second question we had was, are laparoscopic procedures safe for gynae uh, surgeries uh, during uh, COVID uh, times? And Jay again mentioned about this study. This was what you know we used to counsel women about the 50% risk of mortality and 20 uh, of ITU admission and 20% risk of mortality. But I'm so sorry, I can't show you the right side of the screen. It has got actually the list of procedures that was uh, that these patients had in the cohort. Unfortunately, there was no gynae procedures in this cohort, so we were not able to extrapolate this evidence to our gynae population. Second piece of evidence was the initial COVID search uh, data published in May 2020, and there were about 1,128 patients, so we were like, oh, okay, that's a good number. Let's look at it. Unfortunately, gynae is underrepresented again. There were only 10 hysterectomies in this cohort, and we are not sure how it was done, whether it was laparoscopic or whether it was open surgery. And hence, we couldn't use this evidence as well to tell our women actually what risks they have for the surgery that we are planning. So we came up with a local uh, uh, strategy. Um, it was like a, a nine-point um, um, strategy to say, okay, let's, you know, go through the different steps of the surgery that we do and see how we can minimize the risk of aerosol generated because of the pneumoperitoneum, because of the trendland bug. And then we said, okay, we'll stick to it until we get further uh, evidence. So if anybody is interested, um, you can see this later. But further down the line, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the British uh, Society for Gyne uh, Endoscopy, as well as the BGCS, all uh, published the guidelines very quickly, one after another. And all this was out by April, May time. And we were glad to know that our local strategy was almost similar to the national uh, guidelines that was given. So we have had a massive revolution in uh, gynae cancer surgery since COVID time. We were initially part of a no color pathway, and then we started operating along the yellow pathway then green pathway, and next in line is the blue. And we have operated along the uh, red pathway for emergency patients. And if any of you have been listening closely to the talk, you know what is missing. There's still no purple in this. Christina, I hope you know you are listening to this. So just moving on to our uh, outcomes. Um, our uh, gynae cancer unit, we have three surgeons. You've seen um, uh, Wendy sitting at the back, uh, Dr. Wendy McMillan, Dr. Vimla Nellor, and me. 
So between us, we have done uh, 47 surgeries. Um, this was for a period of 15 weeks between 17th of March and the 23rd of uh, June. Um, majority of uh, them were majors, 45, and only two were minors. This is the demographics of the cohort of women on whom we have uh, done the surgery. The average age was 61, and the age range being 32 and uh, 86. The average uh, body mass index was 31, uh, with the range being between 19 and 54. Um, it's quite interesting to see uh, eight out of 47 uh, had morbid obesity with a BMI more than 40. Now, you can't see the other part of the screen, but uh, they can, is it? Okay. But 57% of our um, uh, women actually had at least uh, two or more uh, comorbidities. Uh, you know, diabetes or hypertension, cardiovascular um, um, problem, or peripheral uh, vascular disease. 25% of the cohort were uh, either uh, ex-smokers or current smokers. And um, almost 20% of, of our uh, women had an ASA uh, score of uh, more than uh, um, of three or more. I usually joke with the anesthetist, uh, you know, when the huddle, they ask for the ASA, I actually look at the size of the notes and tell, the, tell them the ASA score, but notes are not available anymore. So as a surgeon, I can't do that, but we leave it to the anesthetist who are better at it. Um, surgery details, most of the surgeries were curative in nature, almost 44 out of the 47. And you can see that our laparoscopic doses were still quite good. Um, we, um, attempted to do uh, six, 36 operations laparoscopic, 33 were entirely laparoscopic, three of them needed a mini laparotomy for extraction of specimen, but not for any kind of uh, surgical uh, procedure as such. Um, about 12% had the hysterectomy as an open procedure, and this was intended all along as an open procedure because we were operating on masses with suspicion of cancer. So the average stay in the hospital was 1.77. Uh, uh, the range was between day zero to day 14. Uh, there were two readmissions. One of them was just a mild vault, in vault infection needing uh, antibiotics. Uh, the other, sadly, it was due to uh, cancer progression, progression and the patient did die within four weeks of surgery, but it was not a COVID-related death. It was a rapidly progressing advanced uh, cancer. We, ha we didn't have any perioperative, uh, documented perioperative uh, COVID infection in this uh, cohort of women. When the COVID time started, we um, um, maintained a diary to see if, if we are going to defer any patients with cancer due to um, COVID times. And in that diary, thankfully, there's only one patient remaining. Uh, we didn't think it was appropriate to operate just now because the patient uh, has had the cancer managed with Marina Coil for almost a year and a half now due to her other comorbidities. And we didn't think it was appropriate to be increasing her risk uh, operating just now. So just summarizing the gynae cancer management, there has been no change with the uh, timing of surgery once uh, we know the cancer diagnosis. We have not changed uh, the extent or the mode of surgery or the type of surgery we are offering to the women. We have done quite extensive surgeries, including um, at the uh, uh, lymphadenectomy. And using our contemporaneous data collection and analysis, we have now a good amount of data to reassure the patients and the staff about our uh, unit's outcomes. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephen Douglas from the Orthopedic Surgeons. So I'll just take you through my slides now. So a uh, bit of the background, obviously, as uh, Kalpana and Jay have alluded to, at the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of ambiguity around emergency surgery and elective surgery and risks involved with that. Um, there was a kind of Wuhan paper that there was concerns raised, as Jay's mentioned, about high mortality in surgical patients with confirmed perioperative COVID-19 diagnosis. And I was kind of looking around because this was obviously as pathways were changing and uh, services were getting re rejigged about kind of a more robust study locally, how that applied to our patients, obviously, in a kind of local, uh, it's kind of Scottish setting, and then happened to find the COVID surge collaborative. And uh, fortuitously, Jane, Chris, and Kalpana had already got Tayside set up and running, gathering data, and then all the cold had caught. So I got involved as the, the orthopedic kind of lead because at this point already we'd had a few patients who had tested positive for COVID. 
and we wanted to see if our local data match what was kind of coming out of Wuhan. So I'll just take you through some of that. So probably as a background as well, kind of Kalpana was chatting about challenges. Um, obviously, uh, orthopedic wise, we don't have a, a massive cancer burden in locally in Tayside uh, in terms of sarcoma cases they get managed elsewhere. We obviously still get uh, bony metastases, which potentially require prophylactic or fixation. So they are included. But uh, so this is really just looking at all our emergency admissions. So over the early pandemic between March and April, we had seven patients who were confirmed uh, COVID-19 infection within 30 days of surgery. And just looking through them, we had three patients who were deceased at uh, 30 days post-operatively who were all hip fractures. So that gave us a kind of a crude mortality of around 42%. And as Jay's mentioned, obviously this is a small sample size, but that, that was kind of quite instructive and useful to kind of delve a bit deeper. So I've just included an overview. This is quite a busy slide, but I'll take some time just to show you the kind of demographic and the some trends from the seven patients who at that point had tested positive for COVID. So you can see the majority, six out of the seven, are all hip fractures. Um, We've got mainly elderly patients all over the age of 70, which is obviously a risk factor, as Jay was saying. Got one young uh, patient with an ankle fracture. In terms of comorbidities, a real mixed bag. A couple of patients with obesity, a few with dementia, hypertension, your usual mixed bag of uh, patients presenting with hip fractures. In terms of symptoms, all had were asymptomatic on presentation to the uh, orthopedic unit. And over time, again, positive swab results. And this reflects really a change in practice that was happening throughout the pandemic with initially a kind of screening of risk stratification, whether patients were coming from kind of a nursing home, uh, whether patients had symptoms of COVID. And then as the pandemic moved on, there was routine screening of all patients uh, preoperatively. So some patients, as this lady here, is asymptomatically with an ankle fracture. You can see that that was just the day the, oh, sorry, go back. The day the uh, routine screening came into play. So she was asymptomatic and due to go to theatre, and actually her swab came back about an hour beforehand, showing that she was positive uh, for COVID nineteen, uh, and actually actually been in the house in lockdown herself. So there was a few kind of interesting issues around that. Other patients you can see some had no pre-op swab. Uh, but then had positive swabs post-op. We had patients who had negative swabs four days pre-op, but then two days later, pre-optively were had a positive swab. Some that were negative on discharge from uh, nine wells, but were stepped down to rehab elsewhere and then positive when they got there. Um, and then we move on to our, our three mortality cases. Uh, one who was positive pre-optively, one who was negative day two post-op in nine wells, but uh, then developed symptoms at home and subsequently died uh, 30 days post-op. And then again, a patient who developed a positive swab four days post-op and had uh, no pre-op swab. So with this in mind and the results we'd kind of gathered from that, we wanted to try and have a look in more detail at our more kind of vulnerable group, which are the hip fractures. And that's the vast majority of the emergency work we do. And uh, as people be aware, they're also a very vulnerable group, got a lot of comorbidities. And the 30-day mortality, which gets recorded as part of the Scottish Hip Fracture Database, is kind of well recognised for these patients. And generally speaking, figures range from between 3 and 8%, uh, depending on which figures in a normal year. So we went back and my colleague, uh, Sam Greensmith, one of the registrars, I should give him credit, he was uh, integral in going back with other colleagues and just looking at some of our data. So we wanted to see the lockdown period in 2019 when obviously there was no COVID and compare that to the 11 week period when we were in lockdown uh, this year. So kind of similar uh, number of patients, uh, 30 day mortality is obviously a bit different. The statistical test will tell you there's no uh, statistical difference, but obviously there's a trend there with kind of six more deaths. Uh, obviously in 2019, no COVID patients and in 2020, so far, we've had 11 uh, COVID positive hip fractures. And um, most striking thing is we alluded to with kind of uh, challenges managing these patients through an emergency setting was obviously reduction in theater capacity as uh, services were streamlined elsewhere, understandably, to critical carriers. So there was concerns that with all the different barriers that 
uh, patients were potentially waiting longer for their operation, which we know for hip fractures is well recognised to affect their outcome. So, and then also in terms of uh, the increased requirements for PPE, we wondered whether there was longer uh, operations, longer delays in anaesthetic rooms and various factors. So we wanted to see if there's any trends in that point of view. And interestingly, time to theatre was actually uh, better during COVID, which uh, that was a shock to a lot of us because the general feeling that was some patients were waiting infinitely longer, either waiting for a negative swab result, uh, while that was still in place, or potentially due to that increased theatre capacity and only running with one emergency operating theatre when we, we usually have two. The other interesting thing is length of stay. And generally last year in 2019, the average length of stay for these patients was 12 days, whereas in the COVID period, it was almost half to six and a half days. And again, that comes down to capacity and the fact that there was a, a real push to turn around beds with uh, running out of, at one point, uh, orthopedic ward moving to Ward 27, then uh, dermatology. So the kind of footprint of inpatient beds was lower, so there's a requirement to turn them around quicker. Uh, there is some data that supports shorter length of stay for hip fractures having a reduction in mortality. Um, so whether well, that's a positive factor as well, who knows. So, uh, so yes, we've had 11 COVID positive patients to date uh, that we're aware of. And again, with an interesting mix of them. We've had four who've actually recovered COVID-19 infections. So they had COVID more than 30 days pre-op. So those ones don't really necessarily uh, make the criteria for the, uh, the COVID surge. Interestingly, two of those patients uh, subsequently died uh, at th beyond, or within 30 days, uh, documented as due to other causes, uh, relapse of refractory myeloma and heart failure. But whether COVID had any uh, involvement in that remains to be seen. Um, we've had the three uh, we've had three preoperative patients confirmed prior to the operation, uh, one of which uh, passed away, and that was included in the COVID surge. And then obviously we've had other ones confirmed post-op with no pre-op test, and again two of those have passed away. So over eleven patients who've had COVID at some point, uh, five of those have passed away. So the mortality is around about forty percent for those COVID positive ones three of them are being deemed due to COVID, so that maybe takes the mortality rates around 27%, which is more in line with the other stuff that's been out there. But we recognise that this is a kind of frail elderly group of patients with comorbidities. A lot of them have the risk factors uh, for COVID. Um, so that's obviously been useful to kind of uh, risk stratify these patients and kind of inform family members and manage them accordingly. So pass on now to uh, Christina, who thinks coming in remotely. Stop sharing the screen. Tom, can you see that? Can you just wave at me if you can? Perfect, thank you. So um, I'm Christina Beecroft. Lots of people have alluded to me already as um, being the person that's developed all of the pathways. And um, Kalpana's comment about not having a purple pathway is um, the, the last in an endless stream of comments where people now just pass me in the corridors at nine wells and shout random colours at me. Um, but I think what, what both Kalpana and Jai and Stephen have really highlighted in their talks is that the massive amount of change that elective surgery has been, well, all surgery has been through in Tayside recently. Um, it's, it's the COVID pandemic has affected the way that all surgeons are working and the surgeons have been faced with an immense degree of change and they've had to be, have endless patience, both with the development and implementation of the pathways. It's interesting um, that Kalpana said something very telling, which was, did she think it was easier to work now? Oh, um, she said, um, is it user friendly? Hopefully it will be. Um, is it safe? If probably, and I think that's probably how I would finish my talk, so I might just stop talking now. Um, but what I want to do really in the next few minutes is just talk to you about the, the main pathway that we've developed in Tayside and some of the ways this fits in with local and national work, but also some of the challenges we're really facing in Tayside moving, moving forwards. Um, so back in early April, I was asked by Pam Johnson to work with the clinical directors to develop a pathway that would allow us to safely restart planned, surgical, uh, planned surgery in Tayside. And um, 
you've seen these slides already, uh, you've seen these papers already, both Stephen and Kalpana have alluded to them and obviously um, Jai summarised the work of the bottom paper very carefully. Um, but these were really the only papers that we had to go on about the risk of perioperative COVID infection. Um, and it would seem that mortality in elective cases, the first paper looked at 34 cases, the second paper looked at just over 280. Mortality in elective cases, if you develop a post-op infection with COVID is in the order of 20% which is a significant mortality. And that's in addition to the actual surgical morbidity mortality that we're all used to assessing when we're seeing patients for surgery. So I began to work on a pathway, really, I think it was on the 7th of April, and the pathway is a 14 day isolation pathway. Um, it's called the pre-surgery isolation pathway. It's known more colloquially as the green pathway. And it's really a sort of super shielding pathway. The instructions we give to our patients entering the pathway are that they need to shield in the way that the government sh shielding program told patients to shield at the height of the pandemic. It's a two swab pathway. So patients are swabbed for COVID on the day zero of the pathway to make sure they're negative when they enter isolation, as far as we know. And then they're swabbed on either day 11 or day 12 of the pathway and they're admitted for surgery on day 14 of the pathway. And there's a huge team involved in delivering this pathway, all of which didn't exist three months ago or four months ago. Um, we've actually got a dedicated pre-surgery isolation waiting list hub, and that's fundamental. They coordinate booking patients onto the pathway. Um, really what we don't want is any patient shielding for longer than necessary because we think that will reduce compliance with the shielding and therefore make infection more likely. Um, and so the PSI team very much coordinate with both the waiting list and with us in pre-assessment when we start patient shielding. The PAC team support the patients through isolation. Um, it's very important that we medically assess these patients appropriately because at the moment we're dealing with a much greater increased risk of surgery. So we want to make sure that the risks of the surgery itself are as low as possible. So it's really crucial that we optimize patients preoperatively so, such as things like managing preoperative anemia. That's essential to reduce surgical risk. But we also support patients through the isolation. So the team will phone the patients, they keep on top of them with the isolation, they make sure they're complying, answer any questions they've got. And again, from advice we've had from public health, another department that anaesthesia rarely has anything to do with, but advice from public health is that this is one of the best ways of ensuring patients comply with isolation. Um, I've become very good friends with the virologists in the lab because we don't now just request so many tests. And we've also set up a green surgical zone at Nine Wells, which is based in the West Block. And that's where our patients are admitted to and operated on. And that's needed a massive amount of in input from both infection control and microbiology, as well as from all of the West Block nursing teams, the lead nurses and the managerial staff. And the final thing we have is actually a dedicated community testing team. And this community testing team is a testing team of dentists. So if you look at the picture I've put up, the guy on, in the green scrubs is actually David, who's an ST3 in orthodontics. And Catherine next to him is a specialty doctor in orthodontics. They were redeployed during COVID because um, obviously dental work is one of the highest risks because it's an error, by definition, almost an aerosol generating procedure. And uh, so they redeployed themselves to come and work with us and they our day zero swab is performed in pre-assessment, but our day 11 or 12 swab is performed in the community by the community testing team. We go to the patient's house. So we really can maintain shielding as, as carefully as, as possible, um, as, as closely as we can to make sure we keep these patients as COVID free as, as we can. Um, just to put the pathway into context, um, this is a graph um, from Health Protection Scotland, and it shows basically a timeline of COVID cases in Scotland. Um, with obviously time on the x-axis and number of cases on the y and as you can see on the 7th of April which is when Pam asked me to start looking at this work we, we really were I don't think we knew it then we, we were reaching the point where we were at the peak of, the, of, of infections within Tayside um, when the pathway was actually started on the 4th of May that's when the first patient started isolating we were still very much seeing quite high levels of infection in Tayside and so the pathway was tested at the beginning in a period when virus levels were quite high um, we've been quite lucky in that virus levels have fallen now so that's been allowed us to sort of refine bits of our pathway and make sure that we, we can tweak it to make sure it really does work we've managed to work on any problems that we've um, encountered um, and, but the anticipation certainly as we move forward through the year is that when COVID levels go up locally, the pathway should continue. Um, obviously that's dependent on staff and PPE and kit, 
but but the expectation well I, I don't think we can see, simply stop planned surgery again um, for the the urgent cancer work in particular and the expectation is that the zone will continue when levels increase obviously at staff and kit allowing so I've got some data to show you now from the first three months of the pathway. This was prepared by Rhys Taylor, who's a junior foundation year doctor who's been working with us in pre-assessment. And we've had over 300 patients on the pathway. Um, just at this week, there's over 60 patients isolating for surgery. We've done over 250 operations and over 550 COVID swabs, all of which have been negative. We've had 14 cancellations and, and the reasons for cancellation, I, I I felt when I started this that cancellation would be disastrous and I still think it is because if a patient drops off this pathway we, we can't fill in the theatre time um, so we've lost the theatre because we can't isolate somebody so we've lost a whole day's operating potentially these are major cases that often take a full day so it, it's it's really and it's disastrous for the patients as well who have often invested a massive amount preparing for surgery and um, two patients were cancelled because simply they, they shouldn't have been listed in the first place and that I think reflected a change in the pre-assessment process for this. Um, two patients actually deteriorated while isolating. One, one patient presented to pre-assessment with, I would, I would class it as a brisk sinus tachycardia that by the time he was admitted for surgery had progressed to a very brisk atrial flutter and so clearly couldn't have his operation. Um, quite a few patients have actually been admitted during the PSI period for, for urgent surgery for the condition that they're isolating to have treated electively. And I think that reflects the fact that, that waiting times have been really long. As Calvin has said, a lot of these patients have been waiting months for their procedure. Um, and so they will deteriorate, they will run into complications as a result of their, their, their um, surgical complaint. And a couple of patients have failed PSI. Um, one gentleman took a trip to Lidl. He went very early in the morning and he wore a face mask and took hand sanitizer. But I've had to be increasingly strict with the boundaries of the pathway. Um, th there's a danger at the moment of complacency. You know, we're in a, we're in a bit of a, I'm gonna use a color here. We're in a bit of a purple patch um, in, terms, in terms of COVID. You know, that there isn't a great deal as far as I know in the community, but there is quite a lot just 50 miles north of here. And I think we need to be very careful that we don't become complacent with this pathway because the minute all it takes is one infection and the green zone, it has been entirely compromised. So just to look now how this fits with the bigger picture in Tayside, um, we have a rainbow of pathways in Tayside, as we've already said. I will one day have a purple and a pink. There is a grey pathway that I haven't told any of you about yet. Um, but but the, the first three pathways really are for patients where their COVID status is either known that they're positive or, or it's unknown and they're in the hospital. Um, we have the green pathway, the pre-surgery isolation pathway, which is for the highest risk patients having surgery. And again, Jai's already uh, alluded to which patients that should be, but certainly from the COVID surge paper, it would appear to be men over the age of 70, uh, ASA three to five, so, so um, significant medical comorbidities that may or may not be well managed, patients with malignancy, patients undergoing emergency surgery, and the final group at greatest risk in the COVID surge paper was the emergency admissions, but obviously we can't isolate them. Um, but there are a group of medically complex patients who are ideal for the PSI pathway. There are a group of surgically complex procedures that are ideal for the pathway. And what we really need to do for the PSI pathway is make sure that the right patients are on the pathway and that we, it's not really a pathway for everybody because it's not necessary for everybody. And with that in mind, we now have a blue pathway, um, which was a yellow pathway, but I had to change the colour. Uh, so we now have a blue pathway and the, the blue pathway is for this very group of patients. It's patients who we don't feel that isolation is entirely necessary um, or patients who do not want to isolate or who cannot isolate. Um, but patients following this pathway may choose to isolate for 14 days preoperatively and we have a document that we can give them in pre-assessment that tells them how to isolate but it's not the supported isolation in the way that the green pathway is and it's not a two swab pathway. Patients are simply swabbed at three to two days before admission for surgery. And looking at where this fits nationally, um, certainly this is one of the many documents that have been released both by the Scottish Government and by the UK Government discussing how surgery should be recovered after COVID. And as you can see in the top section, we do fulfil most of the requirements in protection. We do separate patients. We don't have a, an entirely separate site, but we have a site within a site that is a green site. Um, and there is something about appropriate arrangements for staff movement between COVID known and COVID unknown areas. And that's something that at the moment we're having to look very carefully at. 
I, I refer you again to my previous comment of complacency creeping in. Um, so that's something that we are going to have to deal with. And then the bottom section talks about capacity uh, with equitable prioritization, um, prioritization and list usage. Um, and to, to, to really work on that, we've set up in Tayside a clinical prioritization group, which um, is comprised of the clinical directors, um, me, the, sorry, the surgical clinic directors, me, um, some people from theatre planning and also the capacity managers. And what that really is to do is to, is to make sure that lists are used appropriately. And again, Kalpana commented on this perfectly. She used to go to Theatre 21 on a Tuesday and that was when she operated. And now she operates any day of the week, anywhere. And we've, we've asked a massive amount of our surgeons in the, it, it, with all of this pathway development. The, the concept of my list, my husband used to say to me, he has his list on a Wednesday. Um, that, that's really gone now, and list allocation needs to be ba based on the length of particular, particular surgeries waiting list and the number of urgent cases they have on that list. Um, and from a surgical perspective, the green pathway certainly is far more cumbersome. We're trying to make it easier and we're trying to make it as user friendly as possible, but it's a difficult pathway to manage. We've asked a lot of them. We've asked them to retrospectively identify patients for the green pathway. We've asked them to identify operative times for procedures. And we've also asked them to reclassify their cases according to the new national classification for surgical emergencies, of, sorry, for surgical urgency. Um, and I've highlighted the priority three cases as these cases really are the perfect patients cases for the green zone. Priority two cases, um, surgery that can be deferred for up to four weeks. Well, often these patients don't actually have time to, to start isolating unless we're very quick off the mark with our, uh, our pre-assessment and our, our information about isolation. Um, so that's really all I had to say. I'm happy to take any com um, any comments or questions. I suspect there might be many. I see Kishore's in the, on the chat, so he might have something to say to me about all of this today. Um, but I referred before, is it, is, is it the pathway safer? I think it probably is. We're all finding our way in this, but I think it probably is safer. Is it user friendly? I'm hoping it will be, but I appreciate that this is coming in a period of massive change and that you've had to work with us with this. And we appreciate every, all, all the help from our surgical, medical and other colleagues. Okay, thanks very much, Christina. And you managed to get through that without a dog, a child, or a husband trying to break your house. So that's excellent. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to put? Um, you can just turn your mute off and just ask. There's a whole sea of blanked cameras in front of me, but no one wants to ask a question. So Christina, you said that, um, it's your prediction or hope that if, if and when there is a second wave, everything will just carry on. You're, this, it won't be the same as last time. It won't just stop. Um, um, how realistic do you think that, that really is? If, the, if, as some of the modelling suggests, the second wave will be five times bigger than the first. Honestly, Tom, I don't know. Um, I think it depends. I think being able to carry on depends on um, the integrity of the pathway, which I'm trying to maintain. It depends on um, staff and PPE and drug and kit availability. Um, last time we took all the ventilators from Stracathro and Perth ICU um, and some theatres were repurposed, as you know, to be intensive care. Um, and I think it will be a challenge to carry it on, but I think we have to do our very best because I just don't think we're going to be in a position again when we can stop planned surgery. Otherwise, the death toll from, from COVID is going to be far greater than the death toll from COVID, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, um, and even within medicine, we, we recognise that, I think, that uh, the delay to seeing people at later diagnosis at later presentation is a is an issue across all of medicine with a with a big m um it's what kalpana mentioned about her list you mentioned this at the end you know my list is on a tuesday and i do operate this on a thursday afternoon it's the same for for, for physicians and, and i suspect for many people around the around this virtual room um my friday afternoon clinic is no longer friday afternoon and it can be any time of the day any any place anywhere um, Obviously, there's some benefits to that, but it does put one a little bit at kilt, out of kilt to, 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 um, that it's not Friday afternoon and I'm sat in, in the same clinic room I've sat in for the last 10 years. Brave new world. Right. Does anybody else have any questions or comments they'd like to make? Yeah, one question to Christina. Go. Uh, don't you think the elective work will resume or 
So you, you got to mic muted, Christina. You're not muted. I'm just struggling to with the connection a bit. I'm just not struggling to hear you a bit. So when do you think the elective work will resume, like a near normal phase? <laughs> Possibly asking the wrong person. Um, I know that green zone activity is due to increase in the middle of September. We've got, um, I think it's, um, we're increasing capacity again by almost a quarter in September, moving from three theatres to four theatres. Um, and as you know, there's a lot more activity at Perth and Stracathro now. From the 10th of August, there's 30 extra lists a week at Stracathro and 10 extra lists a week at Perth. And that's increasing even more at the beginning of September. Um, these are blue lists, so this, these are unshielded lists with the only green zone being at Nine Wells. Um, so I suppose it's, it's starting now. How long we can sustain it for, I don't know, but, but activity is starting to increase now. And thankfully, that's where my, my husband isn't in the house breaking anything. He's at Stracathro doing a local anaesthetic list. Um, so that activity has, has, um, has increased. Thank you. Okay, so... Oh, can, I, can I ask something? This is Kishore. Please, <laughs> on you go. You're oh. a blank screen. Uh, on you go. Because uh, Christina has said that I should ask something. That's why I'm going to ask something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, Krishna, the first thing to say is that that uh, uh, hats off to you. I've always said that uh, for developing this pathway and uh, I think it is working well and especially for OMFS, it does work well. Now, one of the things that I've always believed in through the COVID pathway, having worked through it with you guys, uh, doing all the big surgeries, is that we now have a lull. I think we should try and use this lull to potentially do two things. One is learn from what has happened, adapt quickly and get ready for the future, but also potentially use the small opportunity when the prevalence is so low in Tayside, bearing in mind what's happened in Aberdeen, to get on and catch up with some of our waiting lists so that our patients don't have to wait too long. So I know that the number of theater sessions are restricted. So all I'm asking is, whether we should look at efficiency as well at this point. <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so Keisha and I are currently involved in a, a mild email tussle about theatre efficiency. Um, there is there is something to be said. There is something to be said for the fact that at the moment you, you have to wonder about the 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 need for a green zone because virus levels are so low in Tayside, we believe, but equally everyone thought virus levels were so low in Scotland until people went to a pub in Aberdeen on, on Saturday night and I've just discovered that a friend from school's son was, was uh, in said pub in Aberdeen on a Saturday night and you think, well, he lives in Tayside. So I, I think we have to be very careful, but I do agree with you, Keisha, we need to look at optimum list utilisation. And I think what the Blue Pathway does allow is that added flexibility. Keisha would like to start using the end of lists in the green zone. And I think if we have three session days in the green zone with planning, we can think about using some of that for blue patients, but we must, must, must maintain the integrity of the green pathway because you know that there's COVID around still and all it takes is one infection with COVID on the green zone. One real problem we have at the moment is staff movement around the green zone. And that's not just medical staff, it's nursing staff. People have said to me, and I, I fully accept this as a criticism of the green pathway, that you come into nine wells and, and basically that's the shielding finished. And Gabby Phillips and I have done a massive amount of work to try and make sure that the integrity of the green zone from the point of view of staff is, remains intact, if you like, by limiting staff movement, trying to ensure that nursing staff, if they're moved out of the green zone from the day, aren't, for the day, aren't moved back into it later on in the day. But that's really challenging to do do at the moment you know people are running on empty the sickness levels I believe are quite high uh, and we're fighting a bit of an uphill battle with that but we are doing our best to maintain the integrity of the green zone accepting Kishore's issues that we should we should, we should utilize this effectively and thank you Kishore you didn't let me down <laughs> okay so thanks very much for everyone for the presentation um, uh, and the lively discussion at, at the end um, one of the things which has not been mentioned is the impact that uh, COVID has had on surgical and anaesthetic training, which uh, is obviously been a, a big thing because if you can't operate, you can't train your trainees to, to do it. Um, 
next week the medical school uh, uh, is going to present at Grand Rounds about how to maximize your, the, uh, the clinical exposure that we have for our trainees uh, particularly in the teaching clinic so if you're thinking about how you're going to um, train people medical students trainees when you don't have clinics to sit in let them sit in um, then tune in next week where Joe Sloan is going to tell us all about the approach to the teaching clinic for undergraduate and postgraduate training so that's the plug for next week after a week after that Jonathan O'Riordan is going to talk about optic neuritis and after that it's a completely blank slate we may I may give myself a couple of weeks off uh, but then into September if you have a, 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 a something you like to talk about uh, service development research change in practice interesting case anything at all just um, drop me a line and I'll give you a slot going into September and October thanks so much for tuning in uh, this will go on YouTube shortly thanks to our speakers uh, and uh, virtual round of applause and goodbye Thank you.